let's review now the relationship uh, which uh, link uh, interaction with motion and uh, make sure that we understand uh, and we will make sure that we understand properly what is what of what in those relations. Uh, so how about if we start with Newton's second law. And we actually have eight versions of it. Now it is that very often uh, you can just see this one and interpret it in various ways. Um, but uh, you can also, I mean, if you want to use unambiguous notation, you can write it down different, different way as well. Uh, so for example, uh, you can have one like this and one like this. And let's now try to figure out what's the difference between these two. Uh, so <coughs> let's start with F. What is F? Can you, can you shout? Force. Net force, correct. It is net force. Now what is, this f what is this F and what is this F? Yeah, because which force? So this is the net force exerted on a particle. This one is? Uh, which one? net external force, right? This one is net external force, and it is not exerted on the particle anymore, right? What is it exerted on? System of particles, or an object, correct? Yeah, now, how did, how did Andrew know that, that these two Fs are different? Because of the M, right? Uh, it's convention, and, and in principle, we are not very strict in convention, uh, how we write it down, but uh, most of engineers will use, or physicists will use capital M to uh, indicate that it's a mass of an object and small m to indicate that it's mass of a, of a particle. Although, uh, as I said, you can, you can have an ambiguous notation and think about this one that it's either object or, uh, or mass. Uh, correct. Now recognize also that, uh, well, now, why do we have only external, net external force rather than the net force? Because some of the internal forces adds up to zero, so rather than adding unnecessary uh, huge number of terms, well, we can find out that, the, that they add up to zero without, without any uh, problem. All right, now the A's are different also. What is this A and what is this A? Yeah, shout. What is this A? Uh, this is acceleration of the particle. Correct. How about this A? Very good. It is, yeah, because if you say, I was, uh, I'm very happy that what you said, that this is acceleration of the center of mass of an object. Uh, because uh, very often in a slang, we would say that it's acceleration of the object, right? Now, when we, when we say acceleration of the object, we have to, to recognize how, what we think about uh, uh, the, I mean, it's motion. How do we describe motion? And, we ask, and it, this version of Newton's second law refers to what type of motion of an object? Translational motion, correct. So it refers only to translational motion, and translational motion is associated with the displacement of the uh, center of uh, mass. Uh, all right, now, uh, just to complete the sentence, this law is not, is not always valid, right? It is, we have to specify which acceleration of a particle we are talking about and which acceleration of the center of mass of an object we are talking about. Can you remind me quickly, shouting it? Which acceleration? Uh, what? Not tangential. Not translational. In an inertial reference frame. Correct. It must be in an inertial reference frame. Now, <coughs> uh, don't think that I'm obsessed about it. Uh, I mean, I kind of am, and I, I bet that I will I will put it on the, on the test. You will have to fill up in an inertial reference frame somewhere. Uh, um, if, uh, if it happens that, that, that the reference frame is non-inertial, 
Acceleration and force are not proportional to each other. Recall that if you put a cup on, your, on the dashboard of cup with coffee on the dashboard of your car and make a left turn, I advise you to make a, a sharp left turn. It will be more exciting. Uh, uh, you will notice that that cup accelerates for no reason in the reference frame of the car. You will not find an interaction which causes it. Uh, great. Now, uh, F is a physical quantity which describes what? We use concept of force to describe force, for example, right? Meaning, because word force, uh, as I said, uh, I mean, like, like yesterday, I was talking about acceleration, force is also uh, uh, an ambiguous word. It is a physical quantity which describes interaction, which sometimes we refer to as force. Uh, I prefer that in the class you think interaction, that you never think about interaction, that it's a force. So, that you so then you uh, distinctly recognize that force is a physical quantity. Because very, uh, very often uh, uh, errors which, uh, which we make is that we are trying to, uh, to relate uh, a physical quantity to an effect uh, by an equation and unfortunately an effect doesn't have a numerical value. Yeah, like like what, mo what is the value of motion, of my motion now? Y you have no clue. How about if I, if I choose a, a quantity which describes my motion, pick up one, Jessica shout. Which physical quantity would you like to you to think of to say about my motion? Any. Velocity, for example. What is my velocity now? Zero. You have no problem to assign a, a, numerical, uh, a value. It doesn't have to be necessarily a numerical value, yeah, because uh, for velocity it's a triad of numbers, not a number. Uh, we still say that it's numerical value, though. Uh, all right. <laughs> Um, so, uh, over here, why don't we quickly uh, refresh our memory about all interactions which we discussed. Quickly. Gravity, Gravity correct. There is a gravitational interaction. Uh, what else? Uh, which law uh, actually uh, describes this interaction? Universal law of gravity, correct. Gravitational interaction is proportional to to masses of all objects and inversely magnitude of the force and inversely proportional to the uh, square of distance between them and it's attractive interaction. Uh, on Earth, actually, uh, how, however, we simplify that. How? A uh, what? I can't hear you. Uh, how, how, how do we simplify that e expression on Earth? No, we don't say that ma one mass is negligible because if we assume that one mass is negligible, then the interaction, that the force will be zero. We don't. Actually, G, M, G capital M over R square, where M is mass of the Earth and uh, R, uh, R is the radius of the Earth, we use the symbol small g for that. No, uh, G is uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. Correct, we assume uh, uh, the same radius, no, no matter where you are. If you are on the first floor of this building or on the roof of this building, we assume that the, that the radius, we use the same radius of Earth, that the center, that the distance didn't change. Yes, yeah, so, so instead of having GMM over R squared, we have what? mg, which is what? Mass times, not gravity, acceleration due to gravity. It's better to say the strength of the gravitational field. Never say gravity, because why, d why I do not allow you to say gravity? Why g is not gravity? Be because gravity is not a quantity and g has a value, right? So don't confuse those two. I mean, I know that uh, automatically because 
we use symbol G, then you, uh, uh, that people abbreviated uh, gravity, uh, but it's incorrect. Later on, when you become engineers and you will use slang, you can say gravity. But not now, until you really distinguish between concept or interaction over in this case and the physical, uh, physical uh, quantity. All right, so we discuss gravity. Uh, what else? Friction, correct. We have two, two types of friction. And uh, one is static friction and the other is kinetic friction. And now, okay, so for example, if I if I accelerate in this direction, what kind of friction the floor exerts on me? Static friction, correct. Despite, I'm moving. Why is it static? Because the contact surface don't slide. Right. We will have, now I'm, now there is a, a kinetic friction between my hand and that uh, surface. Okay, what was, uh, oh, and one, one more thing about uh, uh, static friction. Static friction, I refer to this as an intelligent force. What did I mean by that? That it adjusts itself to a, to a situation. So, for example, yeah, because uh, if you look at Newton's second law, we identify this just by looking at the arrangement of the universe. Yeah, so, for example, look at, my, at the arrangement of the universe, look at, at me and evaluate the static frictional force exerted on me now. Consult with each other quickly. Yeah, let's, let's identify all forces exerted on me. There is a normal force exerted by the, by the uh, floor. There is a gravitational <coughs> force exerted by the earth. And possibility for frictional, and, and frictional force really. Yeah, because I, mean, I'm in, I, mean, I am in contact and, there, and the two surfaces push against each other the bottom of my shoe and the floor. So, so uh, these are appropriate conditions for the frictional force, or for, for frictional interaction. You see that? I use word force uh, uh, as a substitute for interaction. Sorry. Uh, uh, okay, so what is the value of that frictional force now? And why? It adjusts itself, right? Now, it is that a normal force on the other hand also adjusts itself, right? They both adjust themselves to the situation. Now, what is the situation now? I'm at rest. Yeah, my, the, my center of mass does not accelerate. The conclusion is that the net external force exerted on me is a zero vector. The three forces have to add up to zero. Gravitational force is something I cannot avoid. It's down, right? Therefore, and now normal force is up, frictional force is horizontal. How those two will adjust to balance the forces? No, normal force will balance gravity, correct? Because they are along vertical direction. Frictional force has no way to affect the uh, the weight, right? So normal force will adjust itself to the gravitational force exerted on me. They will add up to zero. So to what value will frictional force adjust itself? Also to zero, because otherwise there will be, the net force will have a horizontal, a horizontal component. All right. So there was friction. Now then, there were, then we had normal force. And normal force uh, I mean, we don't have really an interaction which is called normal interaction. Uh, n n n when we say about normal force, we think about a force which is exerted really by the surface in a direction perpendicular to that surface. Uh, what is the interaction? Where, this, where did this normal force come from? How the floor, yeah, because when we discussed normal force for the first time, we were not ready to discuss what is the mechanism of making this force. But later on, we discussed that. Yes, yeah, so what is the origin of that normal force? What kind of interaction? Why, can I not, why I cannot walk on clouds? I would like to walk on clouds. What's wrong with the clouds? Why I cannot walk on them? 
they are not solid enough. So what? Yeah, for, th for the same reason I cannot walk on, 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 on water. Because they are not solid enough, right? And if they were solid, then what would happen? The normal force is created only on solids. Why? Sem yes, it comes from internal interactions where? In the floor, correct. Internal interactions in the floor allows actually to exert that external force. What, so, so I mean, think about, think about the board. So, let, let's see that this is a, that, <coughs> uh, this is a board and I push it over here. How come, oh, I can, how come that my finger doesn't go through? In because, because there is an interaction inside. What interaction? What kind of, w w w how did we discuss that? And what, what did we call it, the effect? Andrew, do you remember that? What did we call the effect which holds this piece together? And actually, more general, it is that I cannot take it apart also. I can pull it. So tension force is exerted in the, the, because of, of that thing too. With a tension force, actually, we have already an, a hint, hint about what kind of force. Where, where does it come from? This comes from elastic properties of the object on which exerts the force. The, for, the floor had to be able, uh, had to sustain shearing stress. Uh, yeah, because I mean, look over here. If could you support it on the side? Yeah, so if I'm push this piece down, if I'm pushing this piece down, right, which means that, that this pen has to pu push it up and this piece has to push it up, right? So at this surface, we have a shearing stress and at this surface, we have a shearing stress. Water doesn't allow us to do that Air, uh, clouds don't allow, allow us to, make, uh, to exert sh uh, 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 shearing stresses, therefore we cannot walk on them. They cannot produce normal, normal force in that sense. They produce kind of normal force in another sense and, and actually uh, uh, I could walk on mercury, kind of. I mean, it would be hard to really to move but I could stand probably. Probably not, because I will flip, because it's, it, it will be too slippery, yeah, but, and, and it will be hard to, to maintain balance but, uh, for, for me. But, uh, but if I put a sphere, uh, sphere, it will, oh, actually, I can put a beach ball on water and it doesn't sink, right? Now, that force is not, although in principle it looks very similar to normal force, it isn't called normal force, it is, it is, it's called, and, and the effect is called, Buoyancy, that type of interaction is called buoyancy. All right, so we got another one. I have already brought up tension. What else did we discuss? Torque, for example. What kind of interaction is torque? Mark, can you help me with that? I think that you are getting me further and further into confusion. Torque is not an interaction. What is torque? Not relation either. It's a quantity. It's a quantity which does what? Describes interaction, correct. So whenever I have, whenever I have force, I can say about torque. Yes, yeah, so right now, for example, there is a gravitational force exerted on me, therefore there is a gravitational torque exerted on me. Just to make sure that you understand, show me, uh, uh, when I say actually gravitational torque, I'm too vague. What should I supplement? Which torque? Which gravitational torque exerted on me? Which one? About the Earth, actually, is pretty complicated. Uh, yes, but Mark is right that it has to be about something. Torque is never. Torque is not just hanging loose. It is always about something. Okay, so now I want everybody to show 
what is the what is the direction of the gravitational torque exerted on me about the tip of your nose that way very uh, very good i mean how about you which way is the torque yeah because i mean if somebody was sitting there you can figure out position vector is in this direction gravitational force is in this direction torque is to your left from uh, carl's uh, position uh, position vector is in this direction force is down torque is that way from here position is in this direction torque is there uh, all right, so torque is not a type of interaction. It is a quantity which describes interaction. Let's come back to interactions. Uh, well, we were discussing something, uh, something more than buoyant force, uh, bu uh, buoyancy in, uh, in, uh, uh, in liquid. Because buoyancy uh, occurs when the liquid is uh, stationary. Now, if liquid is moving, something else happen. Uh, can I borrow your... Uh, two pages of your yeah, okay if I start to blow between the pages yeah I will be pumping air between the pages so obviously the pages will move which way together or further apart together correct how doesn't uh, it le looks to me like it doesn't make sense yeah i'm i'm pushing more air into between the 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 uh, uh, pages and it pulls the pages together why because because that air here was moving uh, moving relatively fast yes yeah, so if it is moving fast uh, i mean fact th fact that it was more air traveling didn't matter as much that is that it, it had kinetic energy and by inertia actually was getting out from there uh, so it reduced pressure over here and here we had atmospheric pressure which squeezed the pages together oops so uh, <coughs> what was that uh, what was that force uh, or, or what law describes it Bernoulli law describes it right the force is called malus uh, Malus law, uh, Malus, uh, no, uh, Magnus force. Uh, all right. Um, did we discuss any more interactions? Work. Okay. Uh, uh, how do I recognize from configuration that this type of interaction occurs? It's not an interaction again. <laughs> What is it? Now, think about it. Whenever you have a, numer a numerical value to something, it means that it is what? A quantity. Correct. Yeah. Now, in, uh, interactions are effects. These are not quantities. Therefore, they don't have numerical values. Yeah. This is why I want you, for example, to call G that this is acceleration due to gravity because acceleration due to gravity is what quantity of uh, quantity or an effect quantity acceleration due to gravity is quantity now when you say that g is gravity you are creating a source of confusion in slang we do that uh, yeah we, we we indeed a lot of people will think about this uh, uh, the number g as gravity but really they would mean acceleration due to gravity it is just faster to say gravity and uh, <coughs> uh, now i confuse myself what did i want to say uh, so if uh, if we think unambiguously and recognize that the g is acceleration due to gravity then gravity the other gravity refers to interaction and it's not a quantity so so uh, now how did we get uh, from work to gravity i got confused with that too 
Uh, anyway, so work is a quantity. Oh, yeah, yeah, because, because it has a numerical value. We can assign a numerical value. It means that it is a quantity. Let's look for another interaction. Lift, correct. Lift is an interaction, right? It is when an object moves in a, in a liquid, there is lift exerted due to the condo effect, right? Uh, really, it is that the object here, yeah, for example, if you, uh, if you drive your car uh, with a window open, or if you are a, better a passenger, if you pull out your hand at an angle like that, you will feel that it is being lifted up. Right? The reason for it is because with, the, with your hand, you are pushing air downward. Well, if you are pushing air downward, air is aware of a law in physics which says that it has to push you in the opposite direction. Which law the air is af uh, aware of? Newton's third law. All right, it never spelled it out, but it knows that it is. Um, okay. Now, how about if we take a look at some other versions of Newton's second law? Uh, what are these? Okay, let's read that. Yeah, so over here, I was, um, I mean, am I clear over here or not? I'm not sure if I'm clear. Let's make sure that I am clear. Over here we have to use small p. And here's capital P. With a small p, it refers to momentum of a particle, cor correct. And capital P, uh, momentum of an object. Now, saying momentum of an object, it's, wh what do I mean by that? Actually, no. Moment, P is not momentum of the center of mass. Now, why that phrase doesn't make sense? Because what, has mo what can have momentum? Can I have momentum? Can I? Yes, I can. Uh, can can the, the pen has, have momentum? Yes, momentum can have, uh, can, uh, have uh, uh, momentum. Uh, how about my location? Can my location have momentum? No, why not? Because it is not, uh, not an object. Only objects can have momenta. Uh, a particle is a, a, a trivial object, so a particle can have momentum too. All right, so why center of mass cannot have momentum? Because it is not an object. What is a center of mass in this case? A certain location associated with the object, correct? It is an abstract point which we assign to an object. If you think about a ring, for example, where is the center of mass of a ring? You, just at the center of the ring. Well, can you touch it? No. Yeah, because I mean, it's just there. So <coughs> don't call P as momentum of the center of mass. P stands for? Total momentum of the object, correct. And now, how do we understand total momentum of the object? Sum of momenta of all particles. Correct. Now, uh, let's take a look. Is this true? Yeah, uh, let's write down for both. Yeah, because now by definition, I would have to add these for all particles. Am I going to get that or not? By coincidence, kind of coincidence, it happens. So indeed, for, the, uh, for an object, you can write down that momentum of an object is calculated the same way as momentum of a particle if we uh, substitute object with a particle located at the center of mass. But you have to be careful with it. Because now, <coughs> let's, uh, let's uh, oh, and here we don't even have a uh, distinction. Uh, 
let's now think about these two equations. What are they, by the way? What are, what are these equations? Uh, no, this is not, uh, the equation is not kinetic energy of, uh, of a particle. The equation is called, yeah, like for example, this equation was called Newton's second law, correct. And Newton's second law was, was what kind of relationship, by the way? Was it a uh, definition, a theorem, or an axiom? Axiom. It's an axiom. We have to know everything from somewhere else, and then we, uh, then we make a conclusion. All right, now, this is, K is kinetic energy, but the equation is definition of kinetic energy, correct. Now, that one is kind of trivial, because what is, uh, be more specific, what is K? It's kinetic energy. What kinetic energy? Of what? Of a particle. This K stands for kinetic energy of a particle. Uh, now, let's think about this one. What is that? This is, for example, could be total kinetic energy. It happens that it isn't. And uh, you have to be careful. Yeah, I brought it up because you have to be careful with words total. You cannot just uh, uh, use a formula which you had to, for a particle and make it automatically valid for an object. Correct. Over here, it was coincidence. This, this one, this is a theorem, not a definition of momentum. It happens over here. And it happens because uh, velocity here is, uh, is uh, not squared or, or a linear function because momentum is a linear function. So, so, so it's, it's easier over here. Now, when, you, when we, uh, so for, uh, yeah, because um, when we add the uh, average velocity over here will be just geometric, uh, uh, sorry, arithmetic sum divided by numbers. Now, with the squares, uh, average, uh, average square is not equal to square of average value. So, uh, first of all, now we have to interpret what is V in this equation. So, what do we refer to uh, as V in this equation? Velocity of center of mass. This is when, when we think automat automatically that it's a velocity of an object. And then what is K? Translational kinetic energy. Correct. Translational kinetic energy. Uh, yeah, so, this time... If I add kinetic energies of all particles, it, it is not equal to the, to, the, to the translational kinetic energy of the, uh, of the object. So be careful how you use these. Uh, by, um, by the way, how, I mean, if we consider, and because uh, if we discuss a very important object for which we related total kinetic energy with translational kinetic energy and something else, what object am I talking about and how was it related? Let me write, down, write it down. <coughs> what was it for? A what? For a rigid body, correct. So for a rigid body, and now let's make sure that we are clear about it. So KTOT stands for total kinetic energy of the entire object. KT stands for translational kinetic energy of the object. Now that one is really difficult. What's that? Rotational kinetic energy. This is what I thought. It's wrong. Yeah, whenever we say rotational, we have to say about what? Yeah, so it's uh, rotational kinetic energy about what? Because be, be about an axis. Wrong. Not fixed axis. Well, if it is fixed axis, then translational kinetic energy is zero. <coughs> yes, so, yes. Axis passing through the center of mass. Correct. Yeah, because do you recall, I mean, where, do we have the ruler here? No. Uh, let me remind you, if I let it go like that, I can think about this motion 
as a combination of translational motion and rotational motion, right? So, because center of mass moves, so there is translational motion. And at the same time the orientation changes, it means that there is rotational motion. So, translational kinetic energy plus rotational kinetic energy about this, this, this axis over here is equal to the total kinetic uh, uh, energy of this object. However, I can, I can think about rotation about this fixed point. And the, if I consider this one, then I have purely rotational motion about this point. So total kinetic energy is only rotational kinetic energy about this axis. Do you, do you understand that? All right, now, uh, I was hoping actually to, to, to start talking about work energy theorem. Uh, so let me just remind one thing. Make sure that you do not confuse which work affects which kinetic energy. So which work affects translational kinetic energy? I would write it down. And by the way, can you read this right hand side? Because I saw that, in, that, uh, that uh, I warned you so many times not to say that, but when you wrote you explained delta Q and delta W on the last test a lot of you describe it in a wrong way tell me how to say how to say it in a wrong way change in work correct in order to have change we have to have an instantaneous value Work is a description of cumulative interaction, therefore we don't have change in it. We can have change in balance, why? On a checking account. Because at any instant, balance has a certain value. We don't have instantaneous work. The same thing is about heat. How about uh, internal energy? Yes system has internal energy at all times at any instant so here we have change in internal energy but over here we have heat delivered to the system work done by the system or if we put plus heat delivered to the system work done on the system all right so coming back to this one which which work affects translational kinetic energy when we when we identify work i think that we have to answer five questions Think about immediately five questions. If you don't see an answer, you don't have to answer loudly, but you have to think about it. What performs work? On what? Due to what type of interaction? How we calculate that work, which is the most confusing, and along which path? So how we calculate this work? Work, we say that it is work done on the center of mass, so when we calculate work, we have, to take, we have to take displacement of the center of mass. So, so for example, if I let it go, did I perform work which affected translational kinetic energy of this object or not? Yes, right, because there was a moment fr from this instant to this instant, as long as, the, as my finger was, was in, t uh, in contact with the object, I was exerting normal force. Center of mass was moving. So I performed work which was affecting translational kinetic energy. How about total? Which work do we have to take here? The yeah, fourth question, the difference is in the, in the answer to the fourth question, how we calculate work. And in this version of work energy theorem, we take the displacement of what? Of, of the point of interaction, point where the force is applied. So if I consider this object now, I don't look where the, what the center of mass, how the center of mass is displaced, 
I have to take the point of interaction, how is it displaced, which means this point. So how is it displaced? It's not. I'm not performing work which affects total kinetic energy. I'm performing work only which affects translational kinetic energy. So this will be all for this semester then. Thank you for your attention and patience throughout those few months. And uh, well, uh, I don't particularly believe in luck. It is always hard work and preparation. I just hope that you are ready for, the, for all the exams and that you smoothly pass, the, pass them and uh, we will meet uh, next semester again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.